Hi everyone, I'm Francesco. I'm the founder and technical director of Erlang Solutions. I've been working with Erlang, initially a programming language, which you know, later became an ecosystem of languages, uh, since 1995. And we're here today to talk about uh, uh, the whole theme of problem solving. Problem solving with both technology and technological issues, but also uh, political and managerial issues. Hi, I'm Robert Verding. I used to work at Ericsson and was one of the initial developers of Erlang together with Joe Armstrong and Mike Williams. Um, this then became the Erlang language and, well, as Francesca mentioned, part of the, uh, an existing ecosystem. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you came about, you know, who came up with the idea of inventing a programming language? Was it a particular problem you were trying to solve? It, it was a particular problem. We were looking at telecoms applications. And we'd done a number of, we were working in a computer science lab, but we'd done a number of um, experiments and found that no language we thought really well suited to solving that problem. And that evolved then into looking at how we would like to solve it ourselves, uh, understanding more properties of the problem, and also developing a language that suited attacking these type of problems. Um, we were very lucky to have a, an external group who came with a lot of feedback who were very knowledgeable in the, pro in the systems themselves, what they needed to be done, and they could give feedback on our ideas of what, what should go in the language and the properties and how you would use these things to try and actually solve the problem. How, how was it perceived internally within Ericsson at the time? I mean, there's a uh, Erlang the movie which has kind of leaked its way and made its way yeah, out on YouTube, yeah. but what, what, what was management's uh, view? Well, there were a lot of, lot of projects going, internal Ericsson projects going on, trying to develop the new systems and the architectures for new systems. So we, in that sense, we were one of them. And well, like all of them, some of people supported us and some people didn't like us, right? But um, we managed to keep on going. We managed to get the first um, group who were using Erlang in, in a commercial product inside. And I think that did very much to ensure that it would keep going. Right? What year was that? When did they start working on this product? Uh, the product came out in 94, I think they started sometime in 92 to mm. work on the product. But this was the group who had done, given us all our feedback for it, so they were very into the system and how we intended things to be used and things like this. And so it came out in 94, um, I assume that 94, that's when it went into maintenance mode, new features started being developed. How did that influence the language? Um, it, it, the base part of the language was still the same, we had got that right or right of the way you could use that to build whatever you need. But new things had to be added in the language that came along. New, new requirements came, a new, few new data types and things like this that were, that were required, or that the people wanted to do that to, make, to, to build their systems more efficiently. What got Erlang mainstream into Ericsson? I mean, when I joined, um, I joined Ericsson in 95 and then as an intern and permanently in 1996. And in 1996, it was really you know, becoming mainstream and all new projects were using it. What happened between, say, 94 and 96? The, there, there was another a large internal project inside Ericsson, trying to, looking at developing the, how to develop the architecture for the new system. And that project, it failed. It just, it, it just didn't work. Their system didn't work. And then they had new pro products that came along, had to start looking for something else, and they started using our system. So basically there was a void all of a yeah, sudden, yeah. A, a project failed, there was a huge void. Yeah. And so, yeah, they, they, they could either do nothing or, or bet on something new, yeah. which might yeah. save their bacon. Yeah. Is that? But there were a number, we weren't the only, only part in Ericsson trying to develop new things as well, so, but our, our system, well, it worked. And there was a product to show that it actually could be used. It's so a very cool, at the time, um, you yeah, the product, yeah, there was, lots of products which were being started. Yeah. All of Ericsson's broadband solutions, so ADSL, fiber optics, uh, um, HFC, so you know, broadband over um, cable TV networks, mm. the predecessor of WiMAX, uh, GPRS, uh, they were, you know, the XD301 switch, uh, they were all based on Erlang. Yeah, it, it was a time of I mean, a major change inside Ericsson, what the type of products er Ericsson were looking at. Before that, it had been the, the AXE telephone exchange, which was an extremely successful product. 
no doubt about that. But then new requirements came, new ta- uh, technology, new ideas, and they just had to get into the system. How it was a whole migration to packet-based switching. It was from, that, yeah. yeah. From kind of fixed, yeah. yeah. You yeah. no longer needed a copper wire from one end to no, the other. No, that was, was a major change. Uh, it was a major change, yeah. yeah. It was a major change in the system and what, what was required. And I think it was just because of the major rethink in it, almost everything, that was a time when new, new ideas could get in. Two questions of the time you know, before, um, when, when Erlang was only available within Ericsson. Mm. I mean, all of this project had 100 plus developers. They did Ericsson just go out on the street and find 100 Erlang developers for each project, you know. So I think at the time they had something like 15,000 Erlang developers or something. It was, no, not 15,000, sorry, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 Erlang developers. And, they were. Know, and we have today companies complaining, oh, it's so hard to find. Uh, Erlang or Elixir developers. How, how did Ericsson do it? That was basically internal people. So they said, yes, this project is now going to, this product is now going to use Erlang, so now they've got people to go out and learn Erlang so they could work on this as well. How long did it take them? That could vary a lot, depending on what, what they were doing. It could sometimes go very quickly, sometimes take a year or so. Very much depend on the product and what, uh, the pressure or the push on it. To do these because I recall studies from the GPRS project, which has you know, today become the 5, 5G, mm. which unfortunately were never published externally, but internally within Ericsson, they came to the conclusion that a student or, or a graduate straight out of university was productive within a month of having attended two courses and then have dabbled and done a bit of self-learning. Someone who'd been working with a particular technology uh, for you know, for mm. a long time, it took them about three months before they became productive, and these were pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, at I, the time. I, do you recall? I don't recall directly. Mm. I know that we took part. We, we were, this work was still, still working in the lab at this time, but, but we took part in doing training of in, uh, internal training for Erlang people or Ericsson people, learning teaching them Erlang, mm. and. Um, there were quite a few. We, we did that as we did quite a lot of that, and I think it very much depend on your background. If you'd work with other systems, you might have been, been become more locked in that technology and might take more time to, to migrate from it and to rethink, because it was a re- large rethink for many people. Still is actually. What was the first company outside of Ericsson you learned about, which was using Erlang? So not university or academics. No, no, I, mean, no, I know no. there was a very strong support. Yeah. You know, back then. So but. what happened was well in 1998, um, Erlang became open source which if I remember correctly was Ericsson's first open source software. And a group of us left the lab in 99 and formed a company called Bluetail. And I think we were the first company outside Ericsson to use Erlang in a, in a product for it as well too. And this, this was in the middle of the IT boom, so it was quite an experience. And then I know you left later to form what has now Erlang Solutions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what got Erlang to be released as open source? Because, I, I mean, the, the whole um, the Cathedral and the Bazaar paper had just been written. Yeah. Um, in 98, I mean, it was the year that the, the term open source was actually coined. Yeah. So it was something very scary and very novel for, uh, <laughs> for, for higher yeah. management. Yeah, it was. Uh, we were very fortunate there, but in the group, not inside the lab, in the group working, um, spreading Erlang inside Ericsson, there was a woman called Jane Wallerud. She was working with that group. And she was, fun, she was f- the base of getting the, the um, Erlang language open sourced. She, she knew how to talk to people and uh, get them to understand that this would actually benefit Ericsson and would, it's not, it should be much better than having some form of secret internal technology which you didn't want to spread. But what were the benefits she sold in to management? You were getting more people using it. You are getting better feedback. Um, the right things for it, tools, applications, and things like this for it. That, that, um, and just a different, you get people with a different view looking at the language and coming with comments and criticisms and suggestions, etc. for it. Okay. Yeah. And what are some of the success stories outside of Ericsson after, yeah, I mean, I mean this was the 25th anniversary this year yeah. of Erlang being yeah. released as open source. So yeah, so our company, Bluetail, was a success. Uh, we were finally bought up by Nortel Networks, around a few, a few steps along that, which 
was fine. Two steps or one step back? One st- well, two steps. First bought up by a company on the west coast of the US who were then bought up by Nortel Networks. So we will end up working there. But then the IT boom ended and things ended, became very different. Um, we were expecting Nortel to, to be acquired by Ericsson so we'd have the full circle yeah, and don't be back yeah, there. But. Yeah, Ericsson was buying stuff there as well too. <laughs> there was a lot of changes going on. Yeah. Um, about that time, I actually left the airline community for a while. So um, again, uh, until I came back and started working for Airline Solutions later. So the, I, for, apart from, I don't know that many. I think you probably have much better contact for what was going on in those, in those first couple of years, right? Well, I mean, um, I think Nortel was, you know, shipping a lot of products, yeah. which were based on. Her. I mean, Airline was spreading like wildfire. In yeah. it started around 2005, 2006, but you know, Nortel, many of the telcos, mm. um, you know, it, it was a way for them to actually save money yeah. more than uh, yeah. So they'd invest and save mm. by investing, both for building your infrastructure, but also saving in terms of increased productivity. Well, it was, still is, a very good language for building that type of system, yep. right? And also, I think, I, I think about then it also started spreading to other types of applications, not just telecom. That's great. I remember working my first banking system yeah. in 2004, yeah, and that was, an, that was a real experience. Yeah, um, yeah databases, uh, NoSQL databases. Mm-hmm. At one point, at the hype of NoSQL, I think seven of the ten top <laughs> you know, key value stores were all yeah. implemented in Erlang. Yeah. It, and it, that re- all that type of stuff really surprised me because, uh, as I mentioned, we were very we were very focused on developing an, a, a language and a system for looking at telecom applications. And finding hearing was being used for other things came as a surprise. I mean, the first time I heard that um, Erlang was used for a web server, I thought, why would anyone want to write a web server in Erlang? But when you think about it. It's quite natural because the type of problems you run into, the type of things you want to solve are very close to each other, to each other actually. So I was going to mention web servers, and, and yeah. the fact is, yeah, we had probably the fastest and mo- most powerful web servers if you look at the benchmarks from you know, 2002, 2003. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no one ever thought of you know, packaging it as a standalone, you know, standalone web server and, and shipping it as, you know, as you'd ship Apache or... Yeah, you know, many of the other web servers. Well, we were very bad at selling it, sell, sort of selling the product, right? We, we weren't very because good at doing that. Um, others came along later that could do that much. This Amnesia was another, I mean, it was the first distributed yeah. database, which I came across in 1995. Mm. And it was, in fact, you know, if you didn't use it for transactions, which you mm. know, we weren't aware of the cap theorem back then, mm. but uh, if you didn't use it for transaction across distributed systems, it mm. was incredibly powerful. It was a distributed yeah. uh, key value store, yeah. which you know, didn't necessarily provide strong consistency of your data, but that was taken care of in your business logic. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, was, it was an amazing cache. Yeah, it, again, that's getting back to things we, just, things we hadn't expected that used the type mm. of properties that Erlang and the system around it yeah. had that provided for it. And it, it just, it's been spread to a lot of different things as well. Yeah, and, and, and again, you know, the question is, how did you know, one pitch to manage, how did one get the budget to go in and write your own database? You know, today, you know, I think, I, I th- doubt many companies would get that budget. You know, it's their database you can just go yeah. out and use. But I, back then, I mean, it must have been huge. From what I can recall, it, it was needed in some of the products. The internal products mm. for they needed a database for doing these type of mm. things, and they needed to be the distributed fault tolerant database. So uh, they were paying quite na- in that sense became quite natural just to implement mm. it in our language. Right? Mm. There was nothing on the market back then. No, there was absolutely nothing no. when it no. came to comes distributed. I remember demoing it in uh, in the nineties, and people were just like, "You'd write in one node, and the data would appear in another node," and people thought it was black magic. They loved it. It's not black magic. It was just how. It, yeah, I know, I know, I know yeah, but they'd yeah, never seen anything like that. And yeah. It was just like, oh wow, this is super cool. Yeah, but I think I think well, from my point of view, the fun part is but, is that they, it was built on the basic concepts inside Alling. Yeah, that they weren't developed for doing Mnesia, but uh, Mnesia could use them in the right in a good way. Yeah, but then the, the only API you could have at the time was through an Erlang API. Yeah, yeah. They did that Corba, but uh, yeah, it's not something we really speak yeah, well, about these days. Yeah, yeah. It, well, in that sense, it was restricted. Yes, to, yeah, to yeah. Erlang systems. When did you realize 
so Erlang is a programming language. I think the first, um, it was running on a virtual machine called the Beam. Uh, initially the Jam, which then became the Beam. You know, the first programming language I think I became aware of, uh, which was an Erlang on the Beam, was Raya, which mm. was a Ruby-inspired uh, um, Erlang, basically, mm. which goes to show it wasn't a bad idea. No. <laughs> uh, if, if we look at, you know, look, look at what happened you know, uh, 10 years later. But um, yeah, we then came across Afene, which was a C-inspired language uh, written mm. by Mariano Guerra. Um, you wrote more or less at the same time, so 2008, mm. 2009, Lisp flavored Erlang. I think that was the first that, yeah, that, that was me, because yeah. as a functional programmer, I started off with Lisp, and I've yeah. always been fascinated by Lisp. So, so. so uh, these are just three or four languages yeah. we mentioned in 2008, 2009. And when did you realize that a program, this programming language you built at the mm. lab had become an ecosystem of languages, you know, together with tooling, virtual machines, frameworks, and different languages yeah. all suited you know, to solve different problems? I think that was a bit later when LXCS started appearing mm. on it. That, that, that was a major change in, in that direction or going towards an ecosystem, right? mm. Because that came, I think, in 2011, 2012, yeah. it was officially for it. And that, that became a very significant language used, uh, used on, on the ecosystem. Mm. And it was, originally came from a lot of influence from the Ruby on Rails environment for building web servers and they, they expected things like tools and development systems and things like this to, just to exist, right? Well, it was, it, and they had a completely different development approach oh, than yeah. what you would have in kind of server-side backend systems. Yeah, yeah. Which was uh, you know, top-down, you know, we were used to bottom-up because, you know, you'd like to solve the hard problems first because if you fail yeah. solving the hard problems, you'd fail in the project. So there's no point yeah. in gluing everything together. Yeah. You know, they were doing UI, UX. You needed a top-down approach because you oh, yeah. to see what you would have done. Oh yeah, oh, yeah definitely. They, they had different targets, different requirements as well too. I mean, a lot of the systems mm. we've been developing, um, we expected them to run for years. And if it took a two months to develop the system, that really wasn't much, that wasn't very bad at all. That was quite good actually. But if you're coming from the other side, you might want to get your system up in a week, right? And then you just have to have different back, different a uh, set of tools which you can use to build these type of things for them. And that, that's what one of the things that came with Elixir was these tools, was these build systems and things like this, which came in from a very early time and helped the language spread a lot, which it's still, still doing. What I really like about Elixir is also the frameworks which come yeah. with it, yeah. where you're productive just by knowing a subset of Elixir. Yeah. Um, yeah have, you, have you looked at any of these frameworks? A bit. And I'm not just talking Alex. I mean, we've got frameworks in the yeah. Erlang world as well, and I'm sure, you know, whatever new languages uh, yeah. come along. Well, I'm, I'm expecting, I, I think, I mean, there are a number of new languages coming along on top of the Erlang ecosystem, and um, I would be very surprised if they didn't come with frameworks. Yeah. Because the language themselves might be very interesting, uh, like the statically mm -hmm. typed languages coming. But without the framework, I think they wouldn't be that interesting for people to actually use, right? Not, not seriously. I mean, one of the questions I always ask programming language inventors yeah. is, you know, what problem are you trying to solve? And yeah. I love Jose Valin's answer to mm. that question. You know, for those of you who don't know, Jose Valin, you know, is the creator of Elixir. And he said, you know, I wanted to bring the power of Erlang to a wide range of communities. Yeah. Starting with the web, but not stopping at the mm. web. So, you know, he's created Phoenix, um, the Phoenix framework, yeah. which is kind of the new Ruby on Rails. So there's a huge influx of yeah. you know, yeah. UI, UX, you know, Ruby and web developers mm. coming into the community. Uh, in parallel, I think um, what happened is they took the work we were doing on Erlang Embedded mm. and started building on it. Yeah. And, you know, I think we were out too early with, with embedded frameworks. Mm. I don't think the world was ready uh, when we were working with, with it. No. And yeah, we had a lot of users, mainly hobbyists, but with nerves, it's finally making it out into production and into the real world. And that's absolutely fantastic yeah. and brilliant. But, he, but he, he had the same idea. He was looking at a, sp a specific type of problem. Yeah. Right? 
how, how can we use the Owling as the base for this? Well, you build a new language on top with specific properties. You have the tools, you have the applications and packages that were there. So people just use them very quickly and get going. Mm. Again, just very, very problem oriented in that sense for it. And for it. And as you mentioned, the Phoenix for building web servers. Mm -hmm. And Ecto for, for doing the, the database backend for them. They were just they came very early on in the system. For and I'm I'm loving all of the components which are slowly coming out. It will yeah. take a while, but uh, uh, which around machine learning. Yeah. And yeah, that's, you know, bit by bit, brick by brick. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they're able to reduce the barrier to entry and accessibility uh, of your know, machine learning mm, mm. in the same way they did it you know, for web development. Uh, again, that's going to be another huge influx. Of, yeah. Of, um, yeah, I've looked a little bit, I'm starting to look a little bit at those systems and um, they seem quite interest, interesting, quite straightforward in many ways as mm. well to, mm. to using them. Um, then we'll see how it goes. Um, but where do you think the future will take us? I don't know. I think one thing definitely is going to happen. There are going to become more languages in the ecosystem. Well, there are something like 35, 36. Yeah, the last there's count. a lot there, but a lot, many aren't used, of course. But I think it's just the fact that Elixir came in and is being extensively used shows it, that there's a lot there we, we can build on or that can be built on. And um, so what's coming now, for example, as example, are statically typed languages because the original Erlang language and Elixir on top are, are dynamically typed and people require static typing or very much and very much would like it. So there are coming a number of statically typed languages built on top of the Erlang ecosystem. I think the first statically typed language which kind of came on my radar was, um, was, was, was um, Alpaca. Yeah, that was but one. But then, you know, Fez. And I think you know, the one which is gaining most traction of them all is uh, Gleam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, it, it, it's become a big requirement for systems, mm. for, for what people want for building oh. their systems. And, it's security, and uh, security, as I see it. Yeah. Uh, you know, with the Beam, Erlang and Elixir and other languages making its way to devices, mm. you know, some of these devices have to be secure. Yeah. And uh, we're seeing, um, Right now, Crichton, mm. which is a Nessiel 4 kind of mm. proven um, operating system, mm. the, 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 the kernel of the operating system has been proven to be uh, safe and secure. Yeah. But as soon as you've got a dynamically typed, and the Beam is a first class citizen, yeah. security is provided by using concepts of, um, of kind of mm. isolation and immutability. Mm. But as soon as you've got a dynamically typed language, you're opening yourself up for a whole new can of worms. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that I know. Un so, well, unfortunately, depending how you want to see it, uh, one of the requirements we had when we were developing the initial, initially developing the language in the, phase, the first 10 years it was in use, required or could not, rather could not handle static, static typing because we want to be able to upgrade the system while it was running a new code and things like that. And do that properly, you would require dynamic mm -hmm. typing. Yeah, because um, you don't link you know, modules together, and yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. But now that's that's well, that, that's changed quite a lot, now, and uh, uh, the static typing requirements are quite strong now. And yeah. I think it will it will come. There's no doubt about that. I think it will come. Um, the language is the, the latest one. Well, the latest one I know about is Gleam, which is being seriously developed, and I think that will start being used. Or there might come something else. I don't I don't know for it, but uh, I think that that is uh, that is something that is being attacked today. Yeah. And when, when that comes, um, that will definitely open up our Lang, the Erlang ecosystem to more uses for it. Because I think once the static typing comes in, it'll probably, probably it'll migrate it to other systems as well, do things for it. So yeah, it's a big change, but I think the system, the system is dynamic and versatile enough to be able to handle things like this. It's not static in that sense, right? So yeah. To the next twenty-five years, then. To the next twenty-five years, yes. Hopefully, we'll see. We'll see what happens with it, how it goes, and uh, it is continually growing. The well, number of companies using it, and the, the number of systems that have written in Erlang languages, the Erlang ecosystem, which people are being extensively used, <coughs> which people just don't realise it is Erlang at the bottom. You know, uh, Joe Armstrong in '96 told me, "Oh, Erlang won't be around forever." You know, something new, something better will come along. And I said, okay. You know, and never would have believed that, you know, tw over 25 yeah, years yeah. on, you know, I'd, I'd still be working with it. Well, I think it, it, it was 
dynamic, it was simple enough in the right way. So you could use it to build, be very versatile for building things on top. So it made it very adaptable. Yeah. So the lot, as we've talked, a lot of new ideas have come, but they've been able to be implemented on top of the Alang ecosystem and at the same time use the benefits of the Alang ecosystem and add new features to it, which and have been required. Just to wrap up, what would you say to those claiming, oh, it's a 25-year-old technology? It was started 25 years ago, but it has continually evolved. Even the Alang language, which actually looks like very much it did before, that new things come in, and we've talked about new languages, new features, um, the, the virtual machine, the beam, that is continually being evolved. That is, every new version that comes along is much better than the previous versions. Not saying the old versions were bad, but just new features come in. And again, they're backward compatible as well, which is a requirement we've also had and things like this. And they'll just keep going. So yeah, so basically all of the changes are happening under the hood. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I think one of the major changes in the recent year is the JIT compiler, just-in-time compiler, for example. That, that which, was a big change, yes. Which was, yeah, it, it, just that, you know, when WhatsApp went in and upgraded their servers, mm. they were able to reduce the server needs by 30% just thanks to this you know, one yeah, yeah, optimization. Yeah. And those are the types of things which are happening under the hood. So languages existing and new languages on top of it, even if they're not evolving, you know, can take advantage of it. Yeah. Oh yes, it is. So no way is the system static at any level really for it. And so work's going on everywhere for it. New yeah. packages are coming in, new languages, new implementations in the base and things like this for it. And um, it just does a lot of things that you want for you without having to worry about it. Like concurrency and parallelism, it's just there, right? And I don't have to think about it. I, I know the system does it, and I, I'm happy with that, it just works. And it works, that's the most, most important thing, it just works, right, for it. Brilliant, well, we'll have to meet up in 10 years time and yeah, see, most see definitely, most definitely. if our predictions are correct and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, it but, won't, I, can yeah. Say, it will, I think it'll still be there, but it won't be the same. Oh, no, absolutely. No, that, that's nothing. Everything strange. changes. And Everything changes. needs to adapt to change. It'll just get better. Just get more and get better, I think, most definitely. Okay. okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay, thank you, Francesco. <laughs>